Hi. Uh, thanks, everyone, for tuning in. I'm Colin, head of research at Abacus AI, and I'm very excited to kick off our final session, Automating AI with Neural Architecture Search, with uh, Debadipta Day. Day is a principal researcher in the Reinforcement Learning Group at Microsoft Research Redmond. He received his PhD in robotics at Carnegie Mellon University, and his research includes automated machine learning, reinforcement learning, robotics, vision, and planning. Day has had many impactful research papers uh, throughout his career, and he regularly is an area chair at conferences such as NeurIPS, ICML, and ICLR. So Day, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Colin and Bindu, for having me here. And um, uh, thank you for that kind introduction. Quite excited to be here. Mm -hmm. Yep. And to all of our attendees, thank you for tuning in. Um, I'll I'll be looking at Zoom and YouTube for your questions. So please ask questions throughout this uh, session. All right. So um, so Dave, I wanted to ask. Uh, so I guess you. Earlier in your research career, you were more on the robotics side. So I was wondering how you, uh, what, what's, what sort of your research progression and how you got into uh, automated machine learning and neural architecture search? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So um, uh, I was actually like, you know, really intensely deeply in the middle of robotics research, right? Like I was writing papers on drone and self-driving car autonomy, planning, intersection of perception and uh, planning throughout my um, CMU years and then um, even in the first couple of years at MSR. I think what happened was um, MSR has this like, you know, um, very gigantic mass of really excellent machine learning researchers of, uh, of in, in almost all areas of machine learning. And um, you, I got just pulled in the gravitational wave towards more and more on the machine learning side. I think what happened is, I, I, mean, uh, I, I wouldn't say it was purely an accident. I think um, even during my thesis years, like my, th my thesis title is predicting sets and lists, and it's actually about using submodular optimization for uh, in, um, and in, in, in machine learning and, and um, applied to some robotics problems, of course, uh, but uh, none of the techniques are specific to robotics, in fact, I often wrote like papers in computer vision using the same ideas and extensions. So um, I, I actually did some soul searching when I, after the first couple of years at my MSR is that if I really want to do meaning robotics as a mission, right? Like, you know, where you are saying, uh, meaning there are, I have many good friends who are intensely passionate about like, you know, oh, I want to just be uh, see self-driving cars come to uh, real life, right? Like I want to realize that dream, be it self-driving trucking or drone autonomy and, 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 and all that they derive immense pleasure, like, you know, and are immensely passionate from seeing robots work in the real world, doing useful things. Um, and and, and uh, nothing uh, excites them more, right? And I had, and I was like, okay, am I the person who wants to see robots work in the field at any cost? And, and, and that's like, you know, the mission. So is, is, uh, should I work backwards from that mission or do I, am I more interested in the fundamentals of uh, sequential decision-making and, and be it applied to any domain? And being at MSR, I think there was this, uh, because I, I, I saw that at, at MSR, it's much easier to do the latter than to do the um, uh, earlier thing. Um, and so it was, so I had to make a decision. I was like, I, I either go to a place where I am in the midst of the next revolution in robotics, which is also happening right now. Uh, and by, by right now, I mean like 2016, 17, and then it's still happening. Um, or I um, actually leverage Microsoft research for its strengths, right? And, and um, the way uh, AutoML research started happening is um, well, very frankly, I was I was um, visiting John, and, and we were talking about some research paper that I had written, and some paper that um, called Anytime Neural Networks, and um, I was co-author on, and and he had been writing some paper on boosting for neural networks, and we actually were going through the citation list of his boosting paper, and we saw that hey, this is being used by a lot of NAS papers, right? Like you know, they were the ones citing it, and so it actually caught us by surprise. It was a um, so it's like boosting and okay, I, I can see that, like, you know, how that is, that is uh, useful to NAS. 
and and also at the time um uh, i found i mean both me and john found that it was incredibly we could not make sense of like why an architecture looked the way it did like you know as this famous table like you know i, I remember in sitting in the conference room in in msr new york putting up the dense net table right and it went and i think that year or the previous year it had won cvpr best paper award and we were like how would we come up with this table and and and, and i thought like you know hey i'm i'm a newbie here relatively speaking in machine learning terms and but it was it was also like you know interesting to see john was like i have no idea how i would come up with this table and and why this particular table or why this table of magic numbers and and I also talked to like other people who uh, were doing research in machine learning at the time, far longer than I had. And, and the, you know, they, they all said like, look, this is empirical trial and error. Like, you know, yes, there is intuition, you build up and everything. And, and to me, that seemed like a very unsatisfying answer. I was like, I'm never going to, I don't know what this magic intuition is. I don't have it clearly, everybody else does or uh, around me. So, uh, but, uh, so, so I think that's how, was the motivation for AutoML because I personally found that I'm terrible at writing model.py by hand. I don't know what model to write down here, right? Like, you know, sure, I can download ResNet and fine tune it and whatnot, but um, that does not seem a very uh, fun research thing to do research in. But, but uh, thankfully, I also had background in like things like re uh, reinforcement learning, contextual bandits, online learning, and, um, so from an, an, uh, uh, combinatorial optimization. And these things were the ones uh, oftentimes that gets used in um, uh, neural architecture search, right? Like, so the math remains the same um, and, and it's just that your, your uh, function evaluation space changes. So these, these was like, okay, you know what? I don't have to do actually much learning differently, but it's a new fun problem. So it was also uh, refreshing for me. And, and uh, strategically, it just so happened that I happen, uh, Microsoft Research is situated inside a massively large company. And, and, and that makes it very, um, uh, I could see firsthand how uh, much the demand was there, like, you know, like from every data science team to be like, okay, we saw your tutorial on us, we read your paper, you were talking about it in, in that forum, but we want to, Try it on our data set. We draw on. We, I want to do try NAS or AutoML on my thing, right? And then how do I go about doing it? And uh, so I could see that there was that this is going to be uh, big, right? And and I, I could see that this is also probably the future. Like like there's this quote from John that um, really inspired me. He used to say that you know back in the 80s we used to all write decision trees by hand. Nobody would ever think of writing a decision tree by hand today. Why are we writing uh, neural architectures by hand, right? So I, I think within five to ten years, uh, probably even sooner. I Meaning, and you know this uh, as well, Colin. Uh, I think we will no longer be using PyTorch or TensorFlow the way we do now, or, or that is what at least my hope is that we that we would not be writing model.py by hand. We would just point our data sets and um, uh, to NAS or AutoML libraries who will and compute, and then they will give us back uh, answers. Got it. Yeah, that's a very interesting answer. It sounds like a combination of many things. You you were a bit of a, or you worked on a few different types of things uh, earlier in your career that were more general, and then realizing you're at MSR, where, and, and there, there's all these applications, and neural networks are getting harder and harder to but harder and harder to find the best architectures by by hand. Uh, yeah, I, I really like that. Uh, I, I often use the same motivation, which I think I got from your talk on neural architecture search on YouTube, which is uh, like the the dense net architecture, one of the one of the, like, the most prominent architectures back in 2016. Uh, if you look at the diagram, it's it's like really complex and convoluted, and that that's like that. Yeah. It would have been very hard for humans to keep coming up with these state-of-the-art architectures, and that—that's really when the, the trans transition happened. And now, now algorithms are creating the best uh, architectures. And it, yeah, and actually, just uh, so all the audience is on the same page, uh, we're we're talking about automated machine learning, which is like any 
all types of autom all the like any part of automating the process of performing machine learning. And specifically, we're we're also talking about neural architecture search or NAS, as Day has been saying, which is uh, using an algorithm to design the best neural network for a given data set. And uh, yeah, I think it's uh, really interesting what you're saying uh, that, uh, yeah, like if we look in the 1980s, people were writing trees by hand and now, now people are starting to, uh, and then of course it, it's been automated since then. And now, now the same transition is happening for neural networks themselves. Um, yeah, so um, maybe you, you've already started talking about this, but can you describe uh, the progression of neural architecture search technology at Microsoft and how it's helped uh, different applications Im improve over time and what are the best, the, the highest leverage applications today? In terms of highest leverage, I mean, uh, so as you can imagine, right, like, you know, um, Microsoft is also of uh, not only a very large company, meaning, uh, but it's also a very diverse in its businesses, right? So uh, we do everything from Azure to cloud and, and services on top of Azure to video games, to email, office suite, um, so um, Xbox. So uh, there are uh, HoloLens. So there are quite a bit of like, you know, applications and diversity of applications and almost all of them use neural networks in some uh, manner, right? And, and many of them also have real-time constraints. And uh, well, there are constraints on almost any application, be it even if they are not in terms of time or latency uh, or throughput, but in terms of like total cost, um, especially if you are going to use uh, uh, these, if, if there is high amount of traffic. Um, but without going, giving you specific uh, details, what uh, almost all of these applications, we, we saw tremendous um, demand for AutoML, right? Like, you know, the number of times I have received emails, uh, chats, people back pre-pandemic, people just walking up uh, uh, after a talk or, or some meeting and saying like, hey, I want to try NAS on, on my application. And I am the program manager who manages this service. and uh, we are really struggling for cogs and whatnot, right? And then this is this is a story which I believe, if it is true at Microsoft, because in some ways Microsoft is so big that it's almost a microcosm of all enterprises. Like you know, if we know that if this is a problem we are facing, we are with with high probability this is probably true of at least all other large enterprises of similar size or even smaller. Um, so I think. Um, everything that you can think of, Colin, that would be like, you know, from vision tasks to NLP tasks. Uh, these are these are obviously like, you know, uh, proliferating everywhere uh, inside our services. And these, this is um, very, and these are all very high value. Some of the services have billions of use, uh, like, you know, calls a day uh, or to a month and um, with, with hundreds of millions of users. So, um, this is, is extremely important that we scale, extremely important that our uh, latencies and user privacy is all, uh, confidentiality is maintained. And at the same time, we keep the cost of like, you know, scaling uh, under control. Um, so uh, uh, the number of hardware endpoints is also massive. Uh, some services running on an ASIC FPGA, some services running on you know, commodity uh, Xeon CPUs, some, some services using uh, GP, GPUs uh, of a certain SKU, right? So, and, and, and then, and they want to move to like, you know, oh, we have the new version coming out and we would want to move from this server to this server. Um, so how do we do that, right? And, and um, is this the best model still? And I think this is, this is what, what where AutoML and NAS are perfectly positioned to um, uh, make this problem like, you know, easy. Got it, yeah, totally agree about what the, the last part of your answer where NAS is especially useful when you have some architecture that, that, that works on some hardware and then you need to transition to another hardware that maybe has different constraints. You can use, you can use NAS to like automatically find the best architecture that, that fits those constraints. And also, yeah, I guess your your main point is also that it's useful everywhere. Um, although I do have a, a follow up question 
about that. And mm -hmm. I think my question's about like the, maybe the trade-off between like getting more data or higher quality data versus getting a, a better architecture through neural architecture search. And specifically, like I, I have come across some, uh, some of my friends in research who say like, oh, like uh, is neural architecture search really that important? Like what if we just get more data? And I think especially uh, like I've, I've heard this, this kind of thought in, in like, for example, in natural language processing, where I think uh, with, with like GPT-3, as, as I remember, Bert had this like by this like more interesting type of architecture, or I guess you could say like more interesting loss where it's like bi-directional training. But then GPT-3 moved back to a simpler approach and yep. just used more and more data. And of course that uh, outperformed Bert. So, so yeah, I guess my question is like, yeah, data versus architecture and also like whether some applications like NLP or vision are more, we get more bang for the buck for uh, one of these two. So um, I think data is always going to be extremely important. Like, you know, so um, uh, perhaps it's data versus architecture perhaps sets up a false competition because I don't think NAS or, or any AutoML method uh, releases any data science team from the burden of creating high quality, relevant, like, you know, ethically sourced private data and, and all, all those other good stuff, right? So, so in some sense, uh, there is uh, that problem, I don't think NAS fixes, right? So you cannot eke out performance uh, when, when you have bad data and, and whatnot, right? And, and we see that, like, you know, when we interact with product groups, especially uh, if you think of like live services where the data set is changing, almost every day or all every week, right? Like significant parts of the data become stale and, and new data comes in and, and, and the data, data sets are, uh, li unlike in like, you know, when we build NAS, NAS benchmarks and, um, and, and acad academic benchmarks that we often fight our <laughs> academic battles over, uh, a lot of like, you know, product group data sets are evolving. They're living, breathing beasts, right? And, and there's logging in the application and, and it's, it's generating more data. Some of that data is noisy. Um, and, and then there are like, you know, data science, there are scripts and whatnot, which are like, you know, weeding out noise, trying to figure out what part of the logs to not trust, what parts to trust and whatnot. And I don't think AutoML actually really, um, at, 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 least, at least right now in the, in the style of like, you know, NAS research that you and me, uh, primarily take part in. I don't think that fixes those problems, but I do see that there are interesting research problems that come up with like, you know, like for example, I was actually just reading um, uh, submodeler optimization papers, which try to do core set data set distillation. And I think that's a very promising, um, no, where the, where the main idea is that like, imagine in NLP, right? Like, you know, where the data sets are getting ridiculously big, right? Like I went by, um, and if you imagine like what a product group at Microsoft could have, like, you know, it looks way bigger than what you would have in an academic or a public setting, like the pile or something, right? And, and this is, and these data sets, if you were to do just one epoch over them will, will, will cost a very pretty penny for even small to medium models, right? Um, uh, so it becomes important, like, is all this data important? Like, how do we clean this data? Like, I think auto data models are, is, is something we need to auto, meaning other, under the umbrella of auto ML, we need to do auto data as well, right? Like in where we do data set cleaning or um, uh, distillation, data set distillation, subset selection, all of these fun stuff, um, either separately or in conjunction with our like, you know, model optimization, auto ML. Um, so I think th this is uh, a very, very important point, meaning, and, and of course, all the other things like, you know, your uh, uh, fairness uh, and, uh, ethics part of your pipeline, like, you know, because oftentimes people are like, well, I, I did auto ML. I took this very famous auto ML library and I ran it and my job is done. It gave me a good model, right? Like, uh, no, your job is not done. And even though you may have satisfied your model constraint and latencies and performance constraints, um, all the other parts of machine learning still remain right now. Um, and, and I, and I do think that's a very, 
um, but perhaps it's the, the onus is on us, Colin, to to make sure that people don't think AutoML is a silver bullet, right? Like I often write in my new ribs ethics statements that this is not. There is always this danger that people will be like, well, it's an automated method, so I get to be absolved of responsibility because I ran an automated method, right? Like that's not true. Um, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So I guess. Uh... AutoML and neural architecture search are one one very nice tool in our toolkit of many other things like uh, getting higher, like uh, better data cleaning or, or or even just finding more data. Uh, yeah, I also thought it was interesting what you said about subset selection, especially for some of these applications where the data sets are getting really massive and and I, I think that actually goes hand in hand with neural architecture search because if we can find some like subsets that are very much smaller and representative, then we can also rapidly find automatically find the best architecture too. Oh, exactly. Yeah. And this is why this was my whole vested uh, ulterior motive in, in in reading these papers because if you imagine mm -hmm. even running like you know uh, your famous bananas or BOHB algorithm right on on um uh, any of one of these methods right like you know you yes you can um on any one of these data sets and tasks uh, yes you all, all the 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 efficiencies of the method are good and 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 de desirable but it's still not enough because as i said even doing one epoch over the data set is 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 nearly impossible right and so uh, th th this is uh, and this is tough like and, and but i do see promising avenues in that line of research to to speed up NAS, right? Like for higher data set selection, especially for NLP. I'm not really sure about vision yet. Um, uh, I'll have to think harder, but for NLP, I see this very slam dunk thing, like, you know, where, uh, I don't know if this would be worth writing a paper, but especially if you can prove that, like, you know, my Spearman rank, I'm going to select a subset such that the Spearman rank correlation of my architectures is preserved, right? Um, that would be quite a powerful uh, statement to be able to make, right? And 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 how or or how the Spearman rank correlation degrades as my subset becomes smaller and smaller, smaller uh, with respect to this uh, larger data set. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It def definitely seems like a very promising avenue for future work, especially uh, for these applications with massive data sets. I think that there is a bit of like initial work on it, but still there's so many uh, so many refined tools from like the subset selection community that that can still be imported here. You're right. right. Um, yeah. So uh, we have. I see one question in the chat. Um, are NAS techniques susceptible to overfitting? And if yes, are there any general techniques to avoid them? Um, they can be susceptible to overfitting, but I don't think they are any more or less susceptible to overfitting than regular supervised learning, meaning as long as you are careful in, um, um, you know, uh, setting up your data sets and, and, and making sure that you are not optimizing over the test set and whatnot, and then you have a reasonable uh, validation set um, in that respect. Yeah, it makes sense. Uh... All right. So um, one thing I wanted to ask, uh, how do you, I guess we've already sort of touched on this a bit, but how do you think uh, uh, as the field of AutoML and neural architecture, neural architecture search progresses in the future, how do you think it'll like change the dynamics of how companies hire data scientists today? Like, will, will AutoML just completely remove the need for any data scientists in like in 10 years from now or uh, yeah, how do you how do you think it'll play out in the future? Yeah, meaning to uh, uh, to add to my like you know previous things of like you know that AutoML and NAS doesn't like you know really release us from the burden of the entire pipeline, um, being and and all the other associated things like data as we're talking about is that uh, oftentimes and then this is you you can see in like you know like uh, Salima Mershi at uh, uh, MSR has this very. A uh, fantastic paper on like you know ML and software engineering intersection on how data scientists uh, work uh, with 
software engineers and the end-to-end -end life cycle of like you know an industrial enterprise uh, feature that uses AI uh, or pipeline, like you know how how it uh, progresses. And when I read that paper, um, uh, it actually I learned a lot because I often uh, live in slightly an ivory tower of pure research. But one of the things that I uh, that uh, st uh, struck with me stuck with me was that actual modeling in a pipeline is actually one of the least amounts of work. It's everything else that is the massive is dominates like data set gathering, cleaning, infrastructure for logging, infrastructure for serving, uh, making sure that your systems, uh, all the systems engineering to make sure that it's up and running. Um, those are the things that actually dominate. And um, so I don't think data scientists jobs should, should feel any amount of threat from auto ML or NAS tools, right? So I think this is uh, my, in my point of view, this is, if you are if you are a data scientist and you have a high business value uh, pipeline that you are in charge of and you want to develop some model my thing would be hopefully very soon instead of writing or or fine tuning a model that you download from the uh, from model zoo and our famous model the first uh, the first thing you do is Okay, I'm going to first just run a NAS algorithm or an AutoML plus NAS algorithm on my data set and go grab coffee, right? And or, or, or maybe go to sleep and come back tomorrow morning or and whatnot and, and see what it gives me. Like, you know, in many ways, I want it to be a very, as, as one, the, one of the earliest, strongest things you can do, right? So, um, uh, and, uh, and, and gives you, a very, very good baseline and a Pareto frontier, right? Like, and I think the Pareto frontier is very important in, in industry because people are going to, for every point on the Pareto uh, curve, there is an associated cost and then there is an associated customer satisfaction. So that trade-off, unless you have a Pareto frontier, you don't get to see. So I think th these are uh, tools that we should make available to data scientists, but yeah, no, I don't think data scientists are going away anywhere soon, anytime. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it ma makes sense with the Pareto frontier, and that's something NASA is very good at. And yeah, of course, I th data scientists can like go to higher and higher levels of this abstraction, but we still uh, need yeah. the data scientists. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, what do you think are the most uh, most interesting recent developments in auto or neural architecture search, or the or the most interesting? potential uh, like like future like yeah most interesting potential future directions in in the area so from all, reading all the papers right like you know so i will begin with like you know uh, actually what are some of like i would say the anti developments in a, in a way where which is there has been in the past four or five years, this tremendous exponential interest in the academic community in NAS, right? Like both, both from industry researchers and academia, and, and you very well know all this, uh, Colin, and that it has become very difficult for anybody, not just to keep up, but for anybody to even understand what NAS method should I try first now, right? Like, so it's almost as if we have gone from what, what is the first model I should begin my modeling with to what NAS method I should try, right? On my, on my like, you know, if you, if you are in an ML researcher engineer, this is what you are thinking about probably now, right? And, and it's, a, it's a dizzying array of methods which are just like, you know, going around in papers of various qualities. And um, I find that like, you know, uh, what Frank Hutter and you and others in the community are the kind of papers that are almost needed right now are almost like papers which are like let's bring sanity back right like let's examine uh, like like the paper like Amit Talwakar and Liam Lee's paper on like reproducibility and random search in NAS right like you know it's such a very inspiring paper but it's a, it's almost like an anti paper right like it's saying like look these are the things that matter if you look deeper and these are the things that don't matter right and um or nas evaluation is frustratingly hard and and now your paper on nas evaluation is surprisingly easy i think in out, we have all these like you know uh, fits and jumps that the auto ml community is doing but we i think we are overall still 
in expectation, make taking gradients in the right direction. So, um, so I would say that more like I'm, I'm very, I feel AutoML and NAS is promising right now because we have these kinds of papers now, because which are, uh, or like local search is state of the art, right? Like, so this, this is, uh, brings back uh, like, you know, hey, let, let, before you do something complicated, have you done all the simple things, right? And uh, I think this is key also to NAS getting adopted by data scientists everywhere in the world. And I think this is uh, that we don't hype it up with complicated pipelines, uh, but would actually give out the simplest, like, you know, OCAMS razor solutions in a very honest, brutally honest manner. And uh, so, so that's one, I would say one meta development with direction, which is very, which is very good. Um, and then reviewers are getting like, you know, more and more uh, aware that, you, hey, we shouldn't just buy any hype that is being sold to us. We should, we should um, look carefully. Um, secondly, I think uh, uh, in terms of like, you know, research, uh, I think we, 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 we are still doing sort of local search around uh, existing model families, right? Like which have been developed with domain knowledge and expertise, which is which is probably great and, and, and is a good thing to do. But uh, I do think we, we, we need to be able to think about how we are going to dev develop the next transformer, right? Like, you know, let, let's, whatever it may be called, uh, but via NAS, like, can we discover that today? Um, I really like, like, for example, this NeurIPS, uh, Misha and Amit's paper and Chris Ray's paper, um, at least these were at least the a subset of the co-authors on uh, better, like, you know, more interesting general search spaces using kaleidoscope matrices. I thought that was a good idea. I think uh, uh, as, a, as a good first step towards more interesting search spaces. Um, I think more than such algorithms and, and I'm, and because I think there is this tendency for people to like, oh, I want to have my new search algorithm, but I think search is very mature, right? Like, you know, search, meaning the, the, if, you, if you open uh, like, you know, the, the introduction to AI book by Russell Norvig, it, it, it's all about search, right? Like, you know, it's 90% of the book is about search algorithms. And, and, and as, as both as a computer science community, which also, which is way bigger than um, uh, machine learning community, uh, search has, has received, has, has been extremely well studied. And search in the context of NAS is also, we are starting to handle it. But I do think like, you know, search spaces needs uh, a, a better look because I think there's a lot of papers which are going, uh, are still low hanging, going after low hanging fruit and which is useful. And, and, and we will have that and we need to have that. But I do think there are certain, some researchers should take a step back and be like, how do I come up with a search space, which is very interesting and where we can develop uh, interesting uh, things. I like the primary easy paper uh, 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 from Quackley's group at Google, um, but um, uh, which, which tries to like, you know, just do program synthesis. Um, and, and they did find some very interesting artifacts, which seems to generalize in uh, across almost all kinds of transformer um, uh, based architectures and tasks. Uh, but I do think uh, even then they had to seed it with the transformer architecture as one of the things. Um, so I think there's still like, you know, uh, uh, a lot of design uh, power left on the table. And I think it would be great to uh, brainstorm how we can make the search spaces more abstract. Yeah, couldn't agree more with both parts of your answer. First, first is uh, the meta direction of bringing sanity back to uh, to NAS research and also the the uh, yeah we're we're sort of like really just uh, getting diminishing returns on improving the search part of NAS whereas maybe we should start focusing a lot more on the search space part of NAS. Of course, data means uh, what anytime we start to do neural architecture search, first we have to define a large set of neural architectures that we're searching over and then run an optimization algorithm. So a lot of papers are sort of refining the optimization algorithm, but really we should go back to the to step one and think more deeply about which architectures we're searching over. I think, okay. it, yeah, I think it would be really cool if uh, the field of NAS has some like really big win where we come up with like the new like transformer or something for for some other new 
type of task. Absolutely, yeah, I, I, I think, think so. I think we have a bunch of like silent wins, right? Like, you know, like uh, people are increasingly downloading efficient net and um, instead of ResNet, right? Or, or they're downloading uh, uh, NAS-based model checkpoints, uh, uh, but we had yet to discover a new complete class by ourselves, right? Like, you know, that, oh, this is a completely different beast, right? This is not an RNN, this is not a transformer, this is uh, not a CNN, um, yeah, uh, which, which which would be, um, yeah, good to have. Yeah, right, yeah, it would be really cool when, uh, when this starts to happen more. Yeah, of, of course, for NAS, uh, there's always the trade-off between, like, injecting human bias into our search space versus like ha having more efficiency in our in our search but but yeah maybe as, as the techniques get better and as hardware improves we can really have much less human bias and then really start to discover more novel types of architectures um, yeah yeah so uh another question from the chat can can you comment about explainability in NAS today and whether it's a good area for future future research? Um, yeah, I think I think that's a, a slam dunk. I think that needs to happen. Like you know, um, uh, our uh, I think uh, if I'm not mistaken, Marius Lindor at, um, in has uh, uh, papers on interpretability and NAS intersection, and and might there might be a survey on it uh, out too. At, um, uh, but yes, uh, absolutely. Like I think that that's uh, that needs to happen because uh, the architectures from NAS can get get even weirder, weirder in the human sense, not weirder for a computer. But I think that's um, explaining uh, decisions based on models you find from AutoML uh, is probably even more important. Definitely, yeah. I think some of the motivation for that too is also to so like data scientists can trust these techniques more. Since it seems uh, it seems more common than you'd expect that uh, people are still just like doing their own writing their own grid search code by hand rather than like downloading ArchAI or, or or something. Uh, yeah, so definitely ex explainability can uh, can be really beneficial. Um, yeah, we're we're actually almost out of time already. Um, I see I see one question in the Q and A. I guess most of this uh, or the, the session's been more on AutoML, but Day is also a very accomplished RL researcher. And the, this question's about RL. So let me see. It says, in the field of biomedical control systems, um, such as neural prosthetics, the controller needs to continuously adapt throughout its life um, to changes both within the biological system and environmental interactions. Um, unsupervised ML, such as reinforcement learning, looks attractive. Can you please indicate any recent approaches to accelerate the rate of learning and RL control? Um, so, so if I understand the question, uh, like, you know, for, for these motor controllers in neuroprosthetics, uh, the question is, can, can that online adaptation be made more efficient? Yeah. Or, I guess also maybe the, the question of asking like any interesting latest approaches and uh, yeah, the most efficient RL algorithms. Um, I mean, yeah. for the specific domain, uh, I don't think I, I would, I, I would mm. know any because there are domain specific optimizations and whatnot that mm. can be done. Um, but like, you know, but anything like SAC or, or um, PPO variants uh, are, are SAC, especially for offline RL, like if you meaning, which may be important for you uh, to do in, in terms of like, you know, if you don't want to online adapt in a very mission critical, safety critical environment. So offline RL al algorithms uh, like SAC and variants are probably your your first uh, go-to. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, but at this uh, PPO, if you are if you are willing to be uh, do things online, is is not a bad thing to start with. Yeah, but I, I, I guess like, you know, for anything more sophisticated, it would depend upon the domain and then what exactly is how the data comes in, how it varies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, actually that reminds me of this uh, maybe newer field in uh, NAS for RL. So I guess yeah. uh, 
Yeah, I think I saw a few papers on this, but uh, yeah, it makes sense that it can be quite domain specific. Mm -hmm. Meaning there is the auto RL uh, survey paper by Frank and others. Um, so that may be a good mm -hmm. starting point to see how not, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, let me see. Um, so uh, I wanted to ask, uh, do you have any uh, exciting project that you're working on right now that, that you would uh, you want to talk about? Um, uh, so we are, we are excited about like, you know, doing all the transformer backbone search using proxies and, and um, that's one thing. Um, but at the same time, um, like, you know, I think we are spending a lot of time right now, including my, uh, my time on building up uh, Archive and uh, making it more robust, documenting it, uh, adding more capabilities, especially that uh, we see demand for in Microsoft uh, within as well as like, you know, outside. Um, so, um, so I would say like right now I'm in this weird phase where I'm trying to not push more paper, too many new papers out at the moment as, as opposed to building the platform, which is actually very interesting to me because I'm learning a lot of software engineering. I'm working with very accomplished software engineers who, and I'm learning software engineering from them. And, and they often like, you know, try to be very nice at my design suggestions and not laugh too hard. And, <laughs> and that show me how they would do it and why it's better. And so it's, it's, it's a very fun thing for me to, to learn that. Um, as well as like, you know, uh, push a platform um, or, or a GitHub uh, or a tool, like, you know, to, and make it more mature. Um, so uh, so I'm, I'm excited about that. And then, and then I'll, I'll probably swing back to more research, uh, researchy things in, in some time. Yeah, got it. And, uh, and Archive is all uh, open source, right? In fact, maybe mm -hmm. one, someone can uh, post it in the chat later on. Yeah, um, yeah, I link, but um, yeah, it's it's all on GitHub, Microsoft, uh, mm -hmm. slash GitHub.com slash Microsoft slash Archai A R C H A I, and it's MIT licensed, and yeah, everything mm -hmm. we do is there, and and in, in various branches, but we'll we'll merge into main. So, mm -hmm. great, yeah. All right, I guess, I guess we are over time, but uh, any any parting thoughts about anything we've discussed? Well, I would like to ask you, what are you excited about in, in, in NAS, uh, Colin? Because you are quite an accomplished NAS researcher yourself, an AutoML researcher. And what, what do you want, uh, are excited about right now? Um, yeah, one, uh, one, one thing I often say is uh, NAS plus HPO. So I guess uh, there, there's been so many papers on, on finding the best architecture for a given problem, but, uh, but typically we, Typically, a lot of people have this assumption where all the hyperparameters are fixed. But, uh, but actually, this is like quite a lot of bias in like what architectures will discover. For, like uh, earlier, we were talking about, um, about like, uh, yeah, NAS finding some truly novel architecture. And maybe, maybe these novel architectures, like we need to change the learning rate a lot or the batch size a lot to get them to, 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 to outperform the state-of-the-art techniques. So yeah, I think. This is a much harder problem, so maybe that's also why it hasn't been explored nearly as much. But this could be a very promising avenue for for the future. We'll ch chat more offline because I think this is this is probably going to limit us, as you said, like you know, to what architectures we will. Because if our mm -hmm. optimizer just throw NANs just because the architecture is too weird and wonky, but it's it's, it's just that a different mm -hmm. optimizer would have optimized it perfectly, right? So we we might be like. Uh, somebody told me like a very senior ML person that the architectures we are discovering is probably co-adapting to SGD and its variants, right? So, so mm -hmm. we, we don't even know what we are leaving on the table. <laughs> exactly, yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, but right. uh, thank you very much uh, uh, for having me here. And I know we are over time and, and it was mm -hmm. really fun chatting with you. Yeah, th yeah, thank you. And thank you very much again for joining us. Uh, it was very fascinating session. Thanks, Colin. See All right. You. Yeah, thanks. <clears throat>
overall uh, we, we're very happy to be wrapping this up we'll be back of course in sometime in june or july uh, hopefully with uh, equally interesting conversations uh, in the meantime uh, you should uh, also check out uh, some of the workshops we do we actually uh, offer uh, ml operations workshops as well as platform workshops and uh, you actually get a uh, ml operations certificate alongside a, pla a platform certificate uh, for attending our workshops uh, again, uh, you can uh, access them either from amicus.ai or state-of-the-art conference.ai. Uh, talk to you all very soon. Bye.